your weapon. Mm, thank you. Yes. Hi, and thank you for the applause. I'm Robert McBride of All Classical Portland. This I'm is not Carlos Calmar. Right, he's not Carlos Calmar. <laughs> And he's not Norman Wynn, and he's not Scott Showalter. He is Blanton Altspach, who is the recording producer. Look at all those microphones. Look at all those microphones. So this one's being recorded for broadcast, and we'll be broadcasting it for the first time on October 26th. But also, the string music by Morton Gould is being recorded for an upcoming CD by the Oregon Symphony with Carlos, doing pieces that won the Pulitzer Prize for music but are not particularly well known, like string music by Morton Gould. Gould string music, um, Walter Piston Symphony No. 7, and Howard Hansen Symphony No. 4. And that, that'll be along, are, are both of those this season? Yes. Okay. The other, uh, we'll, we'll complete the, that disc this season. Okay. The Piston, I think, is sometime right after the first of the year, the Hansen is in I think April, okay. and so, yeah. And what about the CD that had Kenji Bunch's piece on it? It's in the process of being edited. Okay, and that'll be available when? Uh, I'm not sure I've heard a release date. Okay, all right. So this guy is a former conductor, right? So Re you could- Recovering conductor. Uh, recovering, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've often called myself a recovering percussionist yes. and a repentant composer. You. You could step in and conduct this program. Um, if they were really desperate, but they're not. <laughs> <laughs> they're not that desperate. No. So Carlos Calmar, music director of the Oregon Symphony, is, as they say, indisposed. So who will conduct tonight? If it's, not, it's certainly not going to be me. That would be really bad. It's not going to be Joe Cantrell doing the video thing there. It's not going to be you, probably, or you. You haven't heard anything, so okay. It's not going to be. It is going to be Norman Wynn. Correct. Yes. Who's the associate conductor? So he has to know the program anyway. That's part of his job. He for every one of these concerts, every one of them, he has to be ready to step in to conduct Mein Helden Leben or whatever it might be, if the conductor becomes sure indisposed. And history, musical history, is yeah. full of. Stories of That's true. music directors who came off stage at intermission and looked at the assistant conductor and said, "Get dressed, you're going on." Yeah, so exciting. <laughs> so, while since we have brought up the subject of you as a conductor, mm -hmm. tell us about that. What did you do? What was the coolest thing you did? Oh well, um, coolest thing I did. I think one of the one of the things that uh, that worked particularly well because of I mean, everything, the, the players and the singer, uh, the whole uh, ensemble came together so well was a, a, a performance of Samuel Barber's Knoxville Summer of 1915 that yeah. I got to do. Yay. Yeah. Such really a beautiful, great, beautiful, beautiful singer and, and a great uh, chamber orchestra of, of uh, basically hand-picked players and it was really good. When and where was this? Oh, this was in, uh, in the mid-80s in Houston. Mm -hmm. And... Is there recorded evidence? Uh, there's a cassette of it somewhere in a box. Got a pencil? I haven't, I haven't had that out in 20 years. You so. should get that out and yeah, listen to I it. Yeah, I should get it out. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Yeah. I lobbied for Chamber Music Northwest to commission somebody for the summer of 2015 to make a chamber ensemble version of that, but it never happened. I thought it was a good It idea. could work very well. Yeah. yeah. So maybe that's up to you. Uh -huh. Arranging, have you done that? Uh, not really. No, no, no. no. And, and composing? Or... Uh, other than, you know, com composition exercises in, in graduate school where right. you, you're assigned to uh -huh. write in a certain style and in a very narrowly defined uh, parameters of, you know, a serial piece with a 12-tone row that does these things. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So. Yeah, been there. So how and why the transition from conducting to being a recording producer? I, I joke about it, but it's because it was really kind of true. I, I got into this by being a, an unemployed conductor. That, that could provide <laughs> some motivation. 
Oh, I was, uh, I, I was actually extremely fortunate uh, at the time that I had, had finished my master's degree in conducting, um, and I, I got a chance to start working at a classical radio station. And it was from that job, first as, as an announcer and then as the music director at the station, then the station started doing orchestra mm -hmm. broadcasts and opera broadcasts. So that was how I got involved in recording things for, uh -huh. for broadcast. And then, you know, as work proceeded and evolved, uh, it became more recording and less radio. Right. So Good for you. you know, it's, I, I, I tell people truly, uh, I got where I am, wherever I am, because <laughs> none of my plans worked out. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Yeah, you could have a shirt that said that, you know. That, that's a great lesson for life. We don't know Absolutely. what's going to happen. You don't know. And it's... Yeah. Oh, I came across something a while back uh, that's sort of related to this that I just loved. Talked about the obstacles on our path. You know, we get so frustrated that we can't do this or do that. The obstacles on your path are your path. I think that is so good. That's a great way to look at it. Yeah, it worked for you. All right. So Blanton works for a company called Sound Mirror, based in Boston, and they travel all over the place and record concerts and, and make recordings that are not from concerts. And they do magnificent work here in this room with this orchestra. I, I love the sound of the recordings you make. Great. And Carlos is so good. It's interesting to listen, like, okay, so I work at a classical radio station, we have a library of thousands of recordings. In the case of something that you guys recorded here, the 4C interludes from Benjamin Britten's opera, Peter Grimes, the Carlos conducting. So I was putting together some music recently for a presentation at OMSI about, it's the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, if you don't know, about music inspired by water. And I used some of the storm music from that recording and it was so beautifully played. And the strings, especially the articulation, was so elegant and powerful at the same time. And I thought, yeah, that's Carlos. That's right. And it's way better than some of the other recordings we have. That, that, that's one of the great things about coming here and working here is the, the level of refinement and energy and commitment mm -hmm. that you hear from the orchestra and Carlos in the music that they play. And it, it communicates in recordings. It does. And if you don't have any, they're on the long table in the lobby, along with recordings by our violin soloist tonight, Augustine Hartlich, and more. So, Beethoven Violin Concerto, which is an elegant work written around the same time as the fourth piano concerto, which is also elegant and refined, and the fifth symphony, which is the other extreme, the other side of his personality. And everybody who was around at the time that this violinist named Clement was playing, including Beethoven himself, said the man was a very elegant player. And I think that's probably why this concerto, it just, it just flows so beautifully. Though Clement was not above playing his violin upside down and doing showy things like that, just for grins. But, you know, it's one of the big three Beethoven, Brahms, Tchaikovsky violin concertos. So just, just for fun, of those three, Beethoven, Brahms, Tchaikovsky, who likes the Beethoven best? Oh, interesting. Yeah, me too, me too. Who likes the Brahms best? Okay, I think we're gonna get Tchaikovsky in the number one spot here, right? Because it, well, Tchaikovsky and Brahms are sort of tied, because it's so thrilling. And then there's the Mendelssohn Concerto and a right, lot of Which others. is also one of the three, so. Yeah. One of the three, yes, <laughs> right. Beethoven's Violin Concerto didn't go over very well at its first performance with this Clement guy and Beethoven conducting because he didn't have the thing done until the last minute. So the violinist had to apparently sight read his part at the concert. What could possibly go wrong with that? And so the piece was neglected for a long time until the German violinist Josef Joachim resurrected it at the age of 12. And Mendelssohn was the conductor of that performance. And I love reading stuff like that where these names come up and wouldn't it be great to be there when Mendelssohn conducted Beethoven and yeah. Time travel, we gotta work on that. 
So I have my own feelings about this concerto and why I love it so much. What are yours? Well, I, you mentioned elegance, and I think that's a, that's a great word to use to describe the Beethoven concerto. I also, uh, I also think of poise, mm -hmm. because it has that, it, it has a, a elegance, but also a kind of a nobility and a poetry to it that, that really appeal to me. I mean, I love the Brahms concerto, and the Tchaikovsky, and the Mendelssohn. But the, I think the Beethoven was actually the first of the big violin concertos that I ever paid a lot of attention to as a music student and as a listener. And so it's always been um, uh, very, I felt very close to it in that way. So poise, um, uh, lyricism, not in the same way as the Mendelssohn, for instance, is lyrical, but yeah. And it has a, a feeling about it of not having anything to prove. That's very confident. Yeah, and it's, it's, we're all just doing what we do, mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah. and, and nobody has to really show off and here. now I don't remember how old Beethoven was when he was writing it. He was mid-30s. Okay, so, yeah. he, so was, he, was, he was really... Established, but, yeah. you know... Was a, he, he was uh, firing on all eight cylinders. Right, right. If they had V8s back then. I don't think they did. <laughs> I know they didn't have V12s. Oh, I'd love to drive a car with a V12 someday. So do you know, all right, cadenzas, mm -hmm. Carlos calls them cadences, I keep trying to get right. him to use the English word. Cadenza, in a concerto, that's when the orchestra stops and the soloist shows off for a while, and then the orchestra comes back in. There are two of them in this concerto in the first and last movements. Beethoven didn't write them. Clement probably improvised them. Mm -hmm. But lots of people, there are at least 30 Cadenzas written by other people, composers and violinists for this concerto. What's Hadley? You're using? going to ask me which one he's playing, and now I uh, am going to forget okay. which one it is. Is there one? There's one by Joachim, I believe. Yes. All right. All right. Honestly, I don't yeah. remember. Okay. Well, we'll <laughs> we'll find out. Maybe we will find out. We won't know, though. I don't think it says in the program. I'll I'll ask him to yep. just shout the name out when he starts playing it. Beethoven did eventually write a cadenza, mm -hmm. cadenzas for this concerto in an odd way. He made a piano concerto version of his violin concerto. And for that, he did write cadenzas. And he did something I think is really cool since I used to play timpani. This concerto starts with the timpani, all alone, one, so it's a timpano, all alone. And so for the cadenza, he has the piano and, and the timpani play together, and it's really fun. And I don't know. I guess I'm, I just like that because I used to pretend to be a drummer. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a great and a kind of an unusual way to start a piece. Yeah, and some people criticized him at the time. And it's not playing loudly either. It's That's actually, just, you have to listen because it's very soft. Oh, yeah, I wonder. I wonder if Jonathan Greeny is using his little old timpani, or no, he's using the big ones. He has two sets. So sometimes in like a Mozart or Haydn, you'll see a small. He's using set. the set you can hear. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And we don't know if Augustin Hadlich will play an encore. Don't know. I mean, it's right. kind of a long first right. half. The Beethoven's a pretty substantial concerto. Right. So, so he I, probably won't, but you never know. Yeah. He was here a couple of years ago and played a concerto by Thomas Addis called Concentric Paths. So a new piece, not very well known, completely different. I like that when we bring soloists back mm -hmm. that they, they alternate, they do different kinds of right. things for us. And since we love the Beethoven concerto so much, and Augustine is such a beautiful player, it will be wonderful. And I brought my little binoculars so I can watch him really yeah. close. Then there's this thing called an intermission. The Brits call it an interval, which I kind of like. And you can meet a new friend, you can have a glass of wine, you can throw down some scotch, whatever you want, and brace yourself for the second half of the concert. Mm -hmm. Morton Gould's string music is a piece I haven't heard since it won the Pulitzer Prize in... 1995. 1995. He was really old by then, and while he had had this amazing career 
all the way from vaudeville through radio and writing musicals and concert pieces, very famous conductor at his own orchestra, et cetera, et cetera. He commented to his biographer that it would be really great to win the Pulitzer Prize, and then he said, but I never will. And then <laughs> shortly after that, I was, well, I won the Pulitzer Prize. And the Pulitzer Prize thing is very political. It, you know, all these people who vote and they all have their own biases and et cetera, et cetera. And it really flows with the tides and the, and the times in, in terms of what's considered real classical music. And Gould is sort of a, not sort of, he's a very mainstream kind of composer. Mm -hmm. So there were times in the history of the Pulitzer Prize when he absolutely would not have been considered. And that's sure. probably what he was referring to. But then he got it. Exactly. I love that. And, it, and it's such a wonderful piece. He, he wrote it uh, for Mr. Slav Rostopovich and the National Symphony Orchestra. So, I mean, here's a, one of the world's, one of the great cellists who ever lived, who's also a conductor, um, and, and a, a big piece for string orchestra. It's 30 minutes long in five movements, and it's just amazing. It's, a, it's wonderful music. It's... Um, it's serious, but it's also joyful and rambunctious, and, and, and it really puts the, puts the strings of the orchestra through their paces. I've pestered Carlos a number of times to do big pieces for strings mm -hmm. because he gets such great results working with these players, so I'm really glad. And then this one, which nobody gets to hear, I think there's only one recording of it, and this is gonna be way better than that one. Absolutely. Yeah. Not, you know, I don't, well, yeah. <laughs> because I won't play one note. <laughs> what was your instrument? Trombone. That's what it was. Okay, I knew that and I'd forgotten. So there's no trombone part in this one? No. 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 There is a tango. Exactly. Right. <clears throat> and yeah. a, a nice, nice tango movement. Um, yeah. Yeah. Morton Gould, when he worked in radio, Back in the day when radio was live radio, 30s, spent untold hours improvising on the piano in all kinds of styles just to fill time. What a great thing to be able to do. <laughs> he really was amazingly talented and versatile. The last piece on the program is a real showpiece for pianists. It's called Islamé, an Oriental fantasy, allegedly one of the very most difficult solo piano pieces written by a Russian guy named Balakirev, who was very inspired in this case by Franz Liszt's impossibly difficult show pieces. And also by the kind of exotic nature of the far eastern part of Russia and its neighbors. Right. And at least two different people have made orchestral versions of this flashy piece. We have a recording at the station of one by Lyapunov, right, right. who was one of Balakirev's pals. But I'd never heard this one by Alfredo Casella. But Nancy Ives, the principal cellist in the orchestra, told me that it's ridiculously difficult. Oh, yeah. And I mean, Carlos the, said yeah, yeah. it's harder to play than the other one. Oh, it's much harder. And so they're much probably harder. all going, well, it's as hard for the, the <laughs> It's as hard for the orchestra as the original piece is for a pianist. Great. But it's fabulous. Do they get overtime pay for this? Oh, no, 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 of course not. So why is it harder and why is it fabulous? Oh, it's just, uh, I mean, the, the music itself, the, the, the number of notes and, and the way you have to get around the parts is so dense and, and challenging. But then... Uh, the brilliant way that Casella orchestrates. I mean, it, it all works, but it's all very challenging, so. And you, know. you got, there are two harps? Yep, it's a huge here. orchestra, lots of percussion, yeah. so yeah. Have you ever recorded this, no, this is or the, heard it? this is the first time I've encountered this orchestration. I've heard the, the right. other version. Of the, but of course, you've looked at the score, score in, yep. in preparation for all this, yep. because Blanton is following the scores during the Concerts, all three of them, recorded all three, and, and then making notes when, you're, when you cough, when you drop your handbag on the floor, it's not going to get on a CD, you got to edit all that stuff out. So please be quiet. It used to drive me nuts. Remember beeper watches? Remember yes. those, wa those horrible watches that would beep <laughs> yes. at the top of the hour? And I used to record the symphony concerts in here, and there'd be somebody sitting there wearing a beeper watch, and in the most sublime, exquisite, 
quiet movement of a concerto. Beep. Great. <laughs> So how do you do that? Do you just circle in pencil? Yeah, I just, I just make notes in the score as we're listening, and, and, and I'll, I'll have a, a shorthand indication of it, it was a noise or it was a, a, a wrong note or oh, something okay. else, or something wasn't together. And, right. um, then I go back through, after we've recorded all three concerts, I go back through the score and I edit from one to the other uh, as needed to make a version that will go on the radio. Or on a CD. Or on the CD. Well, now, exactly. do you do more editing for a CD than for the radio broadcast? Um, typically, yes. Yeah. But, so you'll do yeah. you'll do it, and it's done, and then but then you'll come back to it again later and do more. Yeah. Well, typically for a CD, what we do is we do a first edit, which goes to the conductor, and he or the and or the soloist, if it's a if it's a piece with a soloist, uh, I'll do a first edit, send that to Carlos. He'll listen to it, and he'll uh, write back to me his notes of, of things where he hopes that we have something better than what I've used. And so then I'll go back through it again and edit by edit look and say, and, and what I'll typically do is actually, uh, in his notes, I'll make my notes, my replies, and I'll say, yes, in fact, you know, performance two was better than what I used here, and so I've made that change. And then other times I say, no, in fact, this is the best we have. That's so. why I used it, Carlos. Yeah. <laughs> I, I never put it like you that. You never put it, okay. Yeah. But do you guys have a good rapport? Absolutely. Okay, and do yeah. you ever really disagree on something? No. No? No. Are you lying? No. No, okay. Yeah. No. I, I know what you mean. He's a great We're guy. extremely fortunate. I, I can't think of a situation where where we don't have a good relationship with a conductor. So, I mean, we're very lucky that way. Well, yeah. you and John and all your colleagues at Sound Mirror yeah. are very reasonable people and very exactly. talented. And, and we're all, you know, everybody's aiming for the same thing. Exactly so, right. Yeah. You want the highest yeah. quality product in every way right. that, that you can have. And you so do. that's a long answer to your question. For radio, we typically will simply do the first edit. Mm -hmm. Be usually because, in part, it, it's a kind of a tight turnaround right. schedule. Like I said, October 26th. Right. You'll be able to hear this but, concert. But there is an approval process. You know, we, do, right. we do send the edit to Carlos and, mm -hmm. and other people at the orchestra, and everybody listens to it, and we do actually do some revisions. Mm -hmm. So will Augustine get his yep. Beethoven yep. performance? He will get a copy of, of the... He, he'll get each performance, then he gets an edit that I'll put together, mm -hmm. and he has an opportunity before the broadcast to get back and say, don't we have something better here? And right. I'll look, and we'll do so, that. So in, in a case like the Balakirev slash Casella mm -hmm. tonight, right. a piece you've never worked with. So you mm -hmm. buy the score, and you study the score, mm -hmm. and you record all these concerts, and then you have to edit it for broadcast. Right. How much time are we looking at here? I mean, I know it varies. It, it's, only, <clears throat> it's only a few hours. For a, for a radio program, it's 12 and do you do all of 15 it? 15 hours, yeah. Okay, so if you've yeah. been here and produced the session, mm -hmm. you do all the editing. Absolutely. Right, okay. Yeah. What, what was the hardest editing project you've ever done? Mm, hard to say. Um, it mainly gets... In, it, I suppose the hard ones are the ones uh, where uh, a musician is trying to, uh, trying to achieve something with editing that that we really should have done in performance, right. you know. Don't, didn't I do it, but, you know, I'm sure I did it better. And like, yeah. so you get down to editing, you know, one and two notes at a time and, and stitching something together. And, you know, it's, yeah. it's nobody's fault, but it's, right. you're trying to do something, trying to accomplish something too late in the process. Right. So. I, there's a story of Heifetz going through that with a recording producer. I can't remember which violin concerto it was, but they were recording one of the major concertos. And in every take, the producer said to Yasha Heifetz, you're not playing it right. And they got together and they looked at the score together mm -hmm. and Heifetz just shrugged his shoulder and said, I guess that's the way I play it. I guess that's how, yeah. I guess that's how I play it. <laughs> Wow. And so you, then there are other situations where, for instance, we had an opportunity a few years ago to do um, remasterings of some of the living stereo, the RCA living stereo recordings. Like Morton Gould used to do. Including Heifetz's recording of the Mendelssohn concerto. And 
before that remastering work, we had access to the original edited master tapes from RCA. And th you know, this is, you know, edited tape, you know, where they splice and yeah. cut and splice. And we were able to find that in the slow movement of the Mendelssohn, there were no edits. That was a single uncut piece of tape. Hmm. Nice. Did you mention that in the notes? I can't remember if yeah. we did or not. But. That'd be a nice thing to do. I think being a mastering engineer would be great if you don't like people very much because <laughs> you just work with the tapes and, and your speakers and your toys and your ears. Right. And, but aside from that, what do they do? I mean, they're not well, slathering a bunch of equalization on things. Well, a mastering engineer is the last... That's the last stage in the, in the process of getting a recording ready for release. And so a mastering engineer is listening to what a producer and, an, and the recording engineers and everybody else has done to, to, make a to get a recording ready for the audience. And what he's doing is the last details of not, not huge moves in terms of equalization, for instance, but small ones. and, and small moves that make big differences. Hmm. You know, you can frequently um, listen to a recording and decide that what it needs is a, a half a dB dip in a certain range uh, that all of a sudden it's just like cl wiping out, uh, wiping uh -huh. off a, a, a fogged up window and all of a sudden everything gets clear and you've only made the, the tiniest change, but it's a, a, a momentous change. <laughs> so it's, it's details that polish and refine the recording uh, so that it's really uh, everything it can be. And something that most people could not do because they can't hear that yeah, well. These guys well. listen in a way that I still you know, marvel at. Mm -hmm. So let's listen shall we, to a wonderful concert. Norman Wynn will be the conductor, so it'll be really fun and exciting for him. He's probably maybe slightly nervous, I don't know, but he's going to have a great time, and we're going to get to watch him. Absolutely. I'm Robert McBride. He is Blanton Allspy. He's one of the best record producers you'll ever be in the same room with. You're fortunate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.